Hello all. Welcome to Structural Madness. So, if you are regularly visiting um, our channel, then you'll remember that in our previous, we have made a previous video where we talked about what is a torsional irregularity in a building and how it affects the behavior of the entire structure itself. Um, in this particular video, what we will be talking about is how should we be performing a torsional irregularity check per ASCE 716. Now, first thing to remember is and understand is what, what actually is torsion. Torsion is basically twisting, like you twist your arm, right? You're, it's not pulling, it's not bending, it's just a rotation about the primary axis of a member. Um, as you can see in the example in, in front of you, when we apply any load in, in line with the a centroid of a member, then the member typically bends in the direction of the applied load. But let's say you are applying the same load, but it's shifted by some sort of eccentricity, E, from the centroid, then it causes twisting, which is kind of shown on the right over here. And why the member twists? Because centroid of a member is typically the line of resistance of any forces. Now, as we know that if you apply any force that is a distance D away from its line of resistance, so over here that distance D is basically this distance, then it causes twisting moments and that twist has to be resisted by the section which is typically known as uh, the torsional stiffness. Now, torsional irregularity comes under the section of horizontal structural irregularities. Now, there are five different types of horizontal irregularities. Um, in this particular video, we'll just focus on two, uh, torsional irregularity and extreme torsional ir irregularity. Uh, these two are also known as type 1A and 1B type of horizontal irregularity in, in a structure. And with any other types of irregularity, this also comes with a penalty. Like if your structure is irregular, there are different types of penalties and code section references that you have to follow through to ensure the optimum performance of a building under seismic loads. Um, let's first go through the definition of these two irregularities so we can actually understand it better. So just a torsional irregularity is uh, basically the ax drift computed with accidental torsion um, and what you typically do is you kind of uh, measure the displacements of two points let's say this is point A and point B. So you have two different displacements when you're applying earthquake in positive Y and then you calculate kind of average of it and the ratio of the max of two point displacements over average is known as the torsional irregularity ratio so what this section is saying is if that ratio is greater than 1.2 times then your building is type 1a torsionally irregular and notice that this only applies to diaphragms that are rigid or semi-rigid why is that so if you can kind of imagine um, a deformation of let's say a bed sheet which you're holding on two ends then typically uh, the rigidity of your hands is significantly greater than the bed sheet the bed sheet will just keep on bending without any significant deformation in your hands right so similarly a flexible diaphragm when it's supported by a very stiff lateral system the diaphragm just bends on the basis of load uh, rather than creating some sort of irregularity or a differential movement on two ends. Um, I kind of think of it as coupling of a lateral system, not like a coupling of a, in terms of coupling beam, but just the horizontal coupling of the lateral system. Um, so in, in a flexible diaphragm, regardless of what's the stiffness of the two LFRS system on two ends of the bank building, it's just going to deform the same because the deformation of diaphragm is so much more that the load distribution just depends on the tributary area to each wall rather than the stiffness of the wall. But when we have a rigid diaphragm, then the diaphragm kind of couples the two um, lateral force resisting system present on its two ends. And what this does is 
A rigid diaphragm doesn't have inherent stiffness. It is so much more stiffer that it kind of drags the wall along with it without any significant deformation in the, within the diaphragm itself. And over here, if we focus on figure one and figure two, then what hap what's happening in figure one is the stiffness of the lateral system is the same on both sides. So the distribution in a rigid diaphragm to the lateral system is typically based on the stiffness of the LFRS system rather than the stiffness of diaphragm. So we here, if I'm applying a force of F in positive Y, then both the walls are going to see F over 2 because the stiffness of the two walls are exactly the same. But here, let's say the stiffness of this wall is pretty much four times the stiffness of this wall. Then what's going to happen is this wall is going to take a load that's uh, pretty much equal to 0.8F while this particular wall is going to take a load that's 0.2F because this is um, four times as fl flexible as the longer wall. So that's why this section is mainly talking about irregular checks in a rigid or semi-rigid diaphragms because that's where you will see this unequal distribution of forces. This is not going to happen in flexible diaphragm because in flexible diaphragm your force distribution is just going to stay the same as it just depends on the tributary area that the LFRS system is supporting. Now type 1b extreme torsional irregularity is nothing but if your ratio is exceeding 1.4 times max over average that's when you are kicking extreme torsional irregularity into your building. This typically happens when you haven't balanced the stiffness on either side of the building or the layout of the building is very rectangular so that your um, and, and your lateral system is present towards the center. So this kicks something like a torsional sensitivity, which we'll discuss later in this video. So what do we do in checking this torsional irregularity and why? So first of all, we'll focus on two different aspects of torsion. In ASCE, you will find that per section 18, 12.8.4.1 it talks about inherent torsion and 8.4.2 talks about accidental torsion. So what's the difference between the two? Now let's see uh, to understand this difference. First of all, let's let's look at this layout over here. On one end, you have a significantly longer wall about two times as long as the wall on the right, which means the wall on the left is about eight times stiffer in terms of BD cube over 12, right? So this shifts the entire center of rigidity of the building towards the wall on the left. Now, since the center of rigidity is present over here, the center of mass in a uniformly loaded surface is at the center of the rectangle, right? So this creates some sort of eccentricity between the center of rigidity and center of mass. And because if we go back to our first concept, because we are not applying the load at the centroid or center of rigidity of the element, but rather a distance d or x away from it, it's going to create this torsional moment. And this torsion, just because of the inherent shift or um, uh, eccentricity between the center of rigidity and center of mass, it creates this inherent torsion. It, Inherent torsion means the natural torsion that's present in the building without any shift of center of mass or anything. And, and, and what is accidental torsion um, per ASCE? Then what, what ASCE asks us to do is like, even if you have calculated your mass perfectly, you are still required to shift the mass by 5% of the length of the building that is in direction perpendicular to the applied load. So when I'm applying load in let's say y direction, I will have to take 5% of the length of the building in x direction. And why it's uh, length of x? Because your dis uh, displacement in x direction, or I shouldn't say displacement, but the shift of mass in x direction is going to create torsion in y direction. So what this section is asking us to do is 
wherever your center of mass is you shift that center of mass by 5% in plus x and minus x direction for your loading in EQY and this causes an additional moment twisting moment in the system and because of this additional twisting moment you can calculate later on what's the ratio of max over average for this particular plate or the building to see if any type of torsional irregularity kicks in. Now, if, if you're not doing this accidental torsion, let's say, and your building is per perfectly regular, then you will see that the building is fine. You, you are not kicking your um, uh, torsional irregularity 1A or 1B into, into your analysis. But by shifting it by 5%, uh, suddenly you are seeing that your max over average is greater than 1.2. That means your building is now torsionally irregular. And why do we have to shift it by 5%? It's, it's not a random number, but it kind of um, is presented in the code so that in, in reality, if there is any uneven loading in the building, which is getting excited in seismic uh, or earthquakes, then that can be captured in, in your analysis um, so that's why there is accidental uh, a torsion that we have to apply in onto our buildings as i was mentioning the uh, how, how do we calculate this and what are the formulas so after any analysis we typically have something called drifts or displacements of a point a and point b what we have to do is we have to take this delta drift of point A and point B, then calculate the average of these two drifts. Why are we calculating average? Because typically that's the drift at center of mass of the building. Once you calculate this average of the two drift values, you have to take the ratio of max of these two drift points. So in this case, it will be drift at point B over the average drift of the story and that is presented over here delta max is whichever point is displacing more over del delta average if it's greater than 1.2 you are kicking in type 1a torsional irregularity and then if it is greater than 1.4 you are kicking in uh, extreme torsional irregularity over here I'm presenting an example as in why and how do I typically calculate this? What we typically do is we first do a static equivalent lateral force analysis, also known as ELF analysis, um, onto any building. What ELF analysis does is it distributes the story forces through the entire height of the building on the basis of a bunch of parametric equations or um, code prescribed equations in a way. Um, and that particular force is typically applied at center of mass of the building. Now, in this particular uh, example, I've intentionally kept the stiffness of one wall significantly lower than that of other. So I have some sort of inherent torsion. Remember, I'm not shifting the center, uh, the, the mass yet. After I shift the mass, it will move either 5% in positive Y direction or 5% in negative Y direction since I'm applying loads in X direction and the length for 5% will be my diaphragm length in um, Y direction. So what I am showing over here is after finishing up the static analysis for this particular building, it's a 10 story building. I have exported the results um, from ETABS into a spreadsheet to check if my building is torsional or not. As soon as I exported it, what I have to do is I have to take two extreme points on a diaphragm. So over here, I'm taking point 12, um, that is the north point, and point 9, that is the south point. So that point 12 and point 9 are displacing um, in the respective uh, locations, in the column locations over here. Right. Point 12 at story 10, let's say, is displacing 7.7 .7 inches, while point 9 is displacing 4 inches. So first I calculate the average drift um, and then do delta max over delta average. Over here, just because of inherent torsion, the ratio of max over average is 1.31, which means my building is already torsionally irregular since I haven't balanced the stiffness of the two lateral element on either side of the building. 
if I look at my y direction, it's going to be perfectly regular because the stiffness is exactly the same. As soon as I do x direction plus 5% eccentricity, that, is, that means I'm shifting the mass further up on the plate. So plus plus five percent is I'm basically shifting this mass in this particular positive y direction by five percent of the length of the tower plate. As soon as I did that, just like we would expect, since my mass is moving closer to the north point, that point is going to displace more compared to without any shift. So that's uh, that increase from 7.73 to 8.23 while 0.9 should now displace less because it is moved, the center of mass moved away from this particular 0.9. So that, that reduced the displacement. Now if I calculate the max over average, it's obviously going to increase because my max displacement has gone up while my average displacement is pretty much the same. If I shift the mass in negative uh, uh, minus eccentricity, then what's happening is since the mass is moving towards the bottom point 9 that is displacing more compared to the north point and now that reduced my ratio of torsional irregularity so without any shift it was 1.31 it's weighed by about 0 0.05 point uh, when I shifted the mass in positive y and then it reduced the eccentricity when I shifted into negative y that's how we typically do torsional irregularity. I have plotted this, the displacement graph of 0.12 and 0.9 over here. And as you can see that the 0.9, which is the south point, is displacing significantly less than 0.12. This kind of explains that the building is twisting through the entire height and 0.12 keeps on moving more than 0.9 over here. Now, what clauses to follow if we have type 1 irregularity? So, let's, uh, the first clause is uh, section 12.3.3.4 of ASCE. And what it asks us to do is, if our structure is, is in seismic design category D through F, then typically the cord and collector forces, um, sorry, I, I mean just the collector forces, uh, between the diaphragm to the lateral force resisting system, the connection of the co uh, collectors increase by 25%. Uh, why is there an increase in this forces? Because there are limitations on elastic model. It doesn't capture everything properly. Um, and typically from nonlinear time history analysis, it has been proven that the distribution of these forces are very, very unequal. And that is why there is a penalty of 25% um, as soon as your building is irregular because in, in actual post yield stages, the stiffer element is going to remain even more stiffer compared to the flexible element. And just because of that difference in distribution of the stiffnesses, the diaphragm can actually dump more load into this uh, uh, collector lines. Second is 12.7.3, uh, where it mentions that if, if your building is torsionally irregular, then you have to create a 3D model to capture the distribution of forces appropriately. And even with dynamic analysis, we have to capture sufficient degrees of freedom and mass participation. So this just mentions like why um, a 3D structural model is necessary. The third section we have to follow with type 1 irregularity is amplification of accidental torsion. What is amplification of accidental torsion? So instead of shifting the mass by 5%, you have to increase that shift by this amplification factor. Because again, in elastic analysis, the, the model isn't able to appropriately capture the unequal distribution of forces within the lateral system that is caused by torsion. And it, all, it is also not able to capture the uh, correct max over average displacements because of this just 5% shift in torsion. Like if I shift the torsion by 5% or center of mass by 5% in elastic model, the ratio of max over average that I'll get from elastic will be less than what I get from time history analysis. Same thing for the distribution of forces. 
so this kind of tries to amplify that torsional effect and amplify the force unequal force distribution that goes um, uh, that that is present in the building then in terms of story drift limit all the story drifts you check it should be with the um, accidental torsion applied into the model or amplification of accidental torsion you cannot just check your story drift without any torsion in the model then fifth uh, is a uh, 12.61 table which talks about what kind of analysis are permitted and what it says is the, the main clause you have to follow over here is like if your structure is exceeding 160 feet it cannot be type 1a or type 1b irregular if you are planning to do ELF or motor response spectrum analysis in time history analysis it is allowed to go beyond 1.4 for even a 160 foot tall building then um, section 16.3.4 of ESCE is basically um, your time history analysis procedures it says that if you are in type 1a or type 1b horizontal irregularity then you have to consider 5% shift in mass shift of mass in your time history analysis as well so to summarize the six sections you have to follow with type 1a irregularity is increase in collector forces by 25% a 3d model is required then you have to do amplification of accidental torsion drift should be determined with accidental torsion taken into account and if elf build is uh, if you are doing elf or model analysis then accidental torsion is not permitted for buildings taller than 160 feet and last is if uh, there is 1a or 1b regularity then uh, you have to account accidental torsion in time history analysis similarly if let's say you are type your building is type 1b torsionally irregular that is extremely torsionally irregular then what you have to follow through is um, first of all your rho factor will be 1.3 that means all these structural elements that you are designing to resist seismic forces their forces need to be amplified by 30 percent this is mainly because an extremely torsionally irregular building behaves in a completely different way and since the code is derived on the basis of a simpler building layout which is quite regular um, and the ductility r factor and cd factor are based on those regular buildings not an extremely torsionally regular building um, that is why there is typically a penalty um, of 30 percent and that just means you have to increase the sizes or increase the reinforcing in the um, structural uh, seismic force resisting elements and um, you if, if you are um, uh, uh, in, in seismic design category E or F then extreme horizontal torsional irregularity is not permitted so for elements uh, buildings like hospitals or schools uh, which typically with a higher seismic accelerations kind of follow fall into this uh, uh, seismic design category E and F, you cannot allow any extremely torsional irregularity in those structures. Now, why are we considering the um, accidental irregularity into uh, a regular building? Let's say your, your building is very regular and your center of mass and center of rigidity are lining up perfectly and without any shift in uh, mass, you are seeing that your building is perfectly uh, fine your max over average is close to one then why are we requiring uh, why are we required to check the accidental torsion um, and and verify if the building is torsional after shifting the mass by five percent so the reason why we do this is to check the torsional sensitivity of the building what what do i mean by torsional sensitivity so Let's say if, if a building has very large mass moment of inertia or when the polar moment of inertia of the structural system in terms of resistance is significantly low, then the building will be very sensitive to any sort of twisting. Um, the, the way I tend to imagine is um, kind of a inverted pendulum. 
Inverted pendulum will stay perfectly straight upright in a perfect environment. But as soon as there is a small perturbation, then it's just going to collapse because it's in kind something called an unstable equilibrium. So it, this is not exactly the same over here, but if, if your building is very highly torsionally sensitive, so if your building is something like a cardboard box over here, you can easily twist it without any significant amount of moment on either end. But if you have a box, then twisting that box is very hard because it has a very high polar moment of inertia. Similarly, um, if, if you like, what do you typically do when you are trying to rotate something about its point of axis and it is very hard to rotate, you typically kind of increase your lever arm. And by increasing that lever arm, even with a small amount of force, you can twist anything, right? Similarly, if your building has a very um, rectangular layout and your structural system are present towards the center like a core wall, then even by a 5% uh, shift in uh, uh, force applied, it will just kick in your um, torsional irregularity, which, which will tell you that your building is very sensitive. This typical phenomena, why does this happen? It, it's mainly because of the uh, mass moment of inertia. What is mass moment of inertia? Um, mass moment of inertia is nothing but the distribution of your center of mass uh, about the center of the floor plate. So if you want to understand this, you can kind of think of uh, two different floor plates. One is a rectangular, one is square. Notice that both have the same area, 200 times 50 or 100 by 100. And the mass on each plate is also the same. The way we calculate mass moment of inertia is this particular equation for rectangular plates, rectangular or square. And even with the same amount of area and mass, you can see that the mass moment of inertia of square plate is pretty much half of that of a rectangular plate. And mass moment of inertia, uh, the higher the mass moment of inertia is, the more your building is sensitive to torsion. On top of it, there is another factor that matters and it is the uh, distribution of the lateral system. So if I have two walls that are located very closely towards the center of the building, then it has a very low polar moment of inertia. Uh, polar moment of inertia, as I mentioned, is like a, a square plate uh, or I should say a simple 2D plate or a cardboard sheet has very low twisting resistance, which is offered by polar moment of inertia. Um, but a square box section has significantly high polar moment of inertia because of the hollow shape and how polar moment of inertia increases with the distribution of um, mass away from the centroid of the element. So that's why typically core walls are so much more stiffer compared to straight walls in terms of resisting uh, twisting. So what I have done over here is kind of uh, did four different case studies. One is comparing a square tower plate with like uh, lateral system spread it out far with a rectangular one and showed that by shifting center of mass by 5% and subsequently shifting the center of force, a seismic force by 5%, how my torsional ratio changes. Without any shift, as you can see in my Y direction, in the building's Y direction, the max over average for either of the building is one. But as soon as I in include the 5% eccentricity, then in the square building, that ratio increases to 1.07, while for a rectangular building, it increases to 1.1. Note that they have same mass, um, the only difference is I've changed the layout from square to rectangle, nothing else, All right? In other scenario, I am shifting the uh, location of lateral system quite close to the center of the building layout in both the cases. This is typically known as alpha, um, which, which is basically the distance of your 
ratio of uh, distance of your lateral system from the center of the building so over here it will be from 0.19 to 0.13 this is my um, location of the lateral system in y direction so you can see they are pretty close or towards the center of the building itself when when we are looking to calculate the uh, torsional irregularity without any shift in mass then in both the cases it's equal to one but as soon as i shift the mass by five percent then in in the square building the increase or the torsional irregularity factor or i should say max over average factor is equal to 1.13 while for a rectangular building of the same area same force it has increased to by to 1.48 so this kind of tells us why why it is important to shift the mass by 5% and check if the building is prone to torsion or not because you never know in reality how the distribution of mass is going to take place we try to estimate it but it's it's not right there we are not 100% sure it's going to happen and in in reality in any building like people are going to put different storages or different types of let's say furniture or any element in in their in their homes or in their offices which kind of causes this unbalance in the mass and sometimes what happens is one apartment or or office space is like empty while on the opposite side on the same tower plate it's occupied so this also causes the shift in mass and that's why this 5% uh, eccentricity is important for us. Um, and this graph also tries to tell us something similar. Undoubtedly, this is torsional amplification factor and not the max over average. But what it is saying is the closer you are spacing or placing um, the lateral force resisting system, the more sensitivity it has to torsion because again we are reducing its polar moment of inertia which is actually resist good for resisting torsion just by bringing these structural systems closer together that's why people typically say that if you are trying to put if you are trying to place your lfrs system then try to place it towards the perimeter of the building and the only reason why people keep on saying that is is to reduce its torsional sensitivity um, now last thing is like what is the amplification of accidental torsion so amplification of accidental torsion is nothing but your increase in um, shift of uh, accidental torsional so let's say your accidental torsion section asks us to uh, shift the center of uh, force or center of mass by 5% and what tor torsional amplification does is if your torsional ratio is irregularity ratio is greater than 1.2 then we try to calculate the amplification of the shift by this ax factor and what this does is it takes the max displacement of your uh, story over 1.2 times the average displacement and you kind of square it and let's say if that ratio comes out to be ax factor comes out to be 1.5 then instead of shifting the center of mass by 5% you have to shift it by 7.5% now of the length of the tower plate over here it's kind of shown that let's say for a torsional max over average value of 1.47 typically your amplification factor comes out to be like 1.5 to 1.53 and why do we have to uh, do the amplification of these accidental torsion? The, the reason will be discussed in the next video where we will talk about the time history analysis um, and how that time history analysis results, the displacement results of the building are comparing with like ELF analysis for a detailed understanding. So make sure you are subscribed to our channel and we will keep on discussing about different types of irregularities in the coming series, followed by how do we actually do seismic analysis of a concrete or a steel building. Um, thank you for watching this. I appreciate your patience and I hope you enjoyed this particular video.
थैंक्स बाय